Uh, hey, boo boo. That is violate some serious copyright action. Oh, almost agreement, almost agreement at gmail.com, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, go to the website, almost agreement com. Check out the cool stuff going on there. Um, today, 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 if you guys are listening to this on uh, release day, if, if you are super excited and you're listening to this as soon as it comes out, you should uh, stop listening to this and go down to Happy Holler for this sweet, sweet, sweet Hollaroo um, that is going on right now. Hollaroo.co. I uh, got some fun, cool stuff going on. Uh, soapbox Derby, Street Fair, and Concert uh, with a good old headliner of Dishwater Blonde. If you've got uh, the um, time or energy or effort, it's going to be a beautiful day. Great day to be outside doing fun stuff. Uh, Orange and White Games going on, too. You can skip that. Who cares? <clears throat> to practice. Um, anyway, find us on your favorite podcast writer. Give us a f- five-star review, a like, a friend, a follow, a share, whatever it is to help other people know. Text it to your buddies. Text it to your pals. We're going to keep doing what we're doing. This might be a little bit short of a normal episode because uh, i got to go to bed early tonight. Anyway, almost again, everybody. We're going to do a show. Here we go. Here we go. Hey, bud day. Hey. What's up with ya? Not much. Nothing new. Whew. All right. I am uh, in super high stress mode, trying to get the last little bits of this. If you get the chance, uh, go to WBIR's uh, app, and you can see uh, about three seconds of me in a story about Hollerou. <laughs> uh, in my biggest orange outfit I own. Um, but, uh, yeah, Hollerou's tomorrow, and that's that. Um, you guys are all going to see me there freaking out. If you ever want to see me in full on panic mode, this is close as it's going to get, or I'm just going to go into like such panic mode that I just freeze. and I'm just going to sit in a chair and stare at a wall and just go catatonic because I can't handle it. I mean, I've done events before. Do you feel that much on your shoulders? I've done events before, but nothing of, of, of as, as large as this. I mean, this is a big. This is not a small event. Are you the organizer? I am the organizer. Okay. I have help. Don't get me wrong. Gotcha. Um, I, there's we've we've subdivided parts and pieces and stuff like that, and some of it is self um, uh, self inflicted damages, for lack of a better word, because I've got. I mean, I, I, a big part of this is this is the first time a lot of us are working together in any manner. We're neighbors in a small business district on the north side of downtown. And so we've done no real work together. We've talked about stuff. We've we've interacted and done some other things, but we've never done where, you know, it's like, all right, we're going to do this thing. You're going to take care of this. You're going to take care of that. You're taking that. So there's a lot of, at least for me, because it is, I, I, this is not a brag. This is a f- statement of fact. This, this rotates around me. I created this thing, parts and pieces. Like I didn't create the whole image that you're going to see tomorrow, but like, you know, this was on, Hey guys, we should do this. Okay. Let's do this, and then it's paperwork and dealing with the city, which I enjoy. I'm not complaining about any of this. Um, you know, it was like I call all, I, like I was calling all the meetings. I was getting everybody together. Like, like there's a point where I just kind of said, guys, if we're not going to do this, then let's just say we're not going to do this. But and you know, and so we like I, I I again, it's not a brag per se, but I like I I do I do feel comfortable in saying that I don't think this would have happened without me, um, and that. Uh, there's a lot of different parts and pieces, and I've got like 10% of each of them. Instead of having one thing like some of the other team team people have, I'm the center of this wheel of action, for lack of a better word. Okay. It's very humble of you. It's I, it, 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 it's not bragging if it's true. It's Muhammad Ali said that shit. I mean, it is, like, but that's the, that, but that's the way any – like at some point, all events are going to have something of that nature. Right. You have somebody in the center of it, and so like, you know, like – I mean, even stuff as huge as Bonnaroo – you know, you're going to have, you know, you have like who's doing the bookings, who's the bands are, what the lineups are, which bands are on what stage. And you'll have stage managers and stuff that break it out. So it's not like you're trying to do every single part and piece. But at the end of the day, Ashley Caps has got some piece. Uh, I would I would guess, actually. Well, not anymore, but it used to be, actually. All right. um, but Big Ears Festival, Ashley Caps, he's got some piece of everything. Like he has, he's been in contact with the venue. He's been in contact with the different sponsors that are on board. He's stuck like people are hitting him up and calling him and asking him questions about this, that, and the other all the time. And that's been my job in this. And I'm, I'm, again, I'm not bragging nor complaining, but it's been a process. It's been okay. a lot. Cool. I don't know. Where did we start that? I forgot. That was all you, baby. Um, I'm excited to get it off, though. It's going to be a good day. Just come out. Check it out. Anyway, um, OJ Simpson's dead. Saw that. That's crazy. 
Um, I, I didn't realize he had cancer. I don't. Yeah, I didn't know he had cancer either. Um, sure, which wasn't publicized or. Just fell a lot of people the were like, "Yeah, they're afraid people, too many people would be too excited about it." So I don't know. I mean, nowadays, not cancer's not necessarily a death sentence, depending. Oh, you son of a bitch! Yeah. Never mind. I got. Uh, I got. I got pranked. A friend of mine sent me this this link that from the outside it looks like. It's and the headline says O.J. Simpson confesses to family on deathbed. Yeah, and you click the link and that's that dude with the giant, the black dude with the giant horse cock picture used to be going around all the time. Do you remember that? No, never saw that one. Right. It was. I a thought thing. you were going to say you got Rick rolled or something. Basically, same same idea. Okay. So never mind. I was going to go into that part, but I'm glad I clicked on the article. Not that I glad I saw what I saw, but I'm glad I didn't say what I was about to say because I was about to say I heard that he told his family he did it. But that was untrue. <laughs> I didn't hear that. I saw a big old black wiener. No, he just wrote a book about it. Not not if, that he did it, but if, if he, he did, did it. This is how I would have done it. I mean, that's... So if he, like the synopsis, if he actually been in that, I, I wouldn't have actually like stabbed her. I would have strangled her or whatever. I'm just saying, <laughs> if, if, if he didn't do it and wrote that book, or if he did, I'm not sure which one's crazier. You know what I mean? Like I can like like if he did do it and he's getting away with it and the writing the book is kind of like a laughing in everybody's face because he got away with it. I mean it's crazy, but it makes more sense than if he didn't do it. And that was like an attempt to try to prove he would he didn't do it. I'm going to limb to say it wasn't his idea to to even like write that book. All right, that's just I was like, hey, you know, you can make some money, write a book that talks um, about how you could have done it if it was you. But I mean the the ego. Of either version of that, the yeah. ego you got to have to even think for a second. Like I'd be, I could be shit hammered, and you tell me that, and be like, I would go, no. I don't even think there'd be a pause for me to go. Maybe did he do any jail time over the Las Vegas thing? I think so. I believe he did. I know there was a whole big thing about him trying to get his Heisman back and some other stuff. I don't know. Yeah, that was like part of it. Or, yeah, some kind of memor- memorabilia that he met. Met up with the guy that had it as a prospective buyer, and it was like, "Oh no, you're just giving that to me." Yeah. So it just turned into like armed robbery, basically. I mean, there's I think a, something like that. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I don't know. I have, I don't feel one way or the other about it. I don't really. I I'm mad that he's dead, not because I care about him being alive or dead, but because the fact that he died became a news thing. So now we're talking like now it it popped back into the the pop culture for a moment. It's like I could have gone. I could have gone the rest of my life and not thought about him and been okay. So, um, yeah. Thanks for bringing him up. You, <laughs> you fulfilled the prophecy. I know. I'm I'm a sucker for talking about stuff. Can't that, believe uh, you're making us talk about this. I was making you talk about it. <laughs> but here we are talking about it. I said, that's all new. I, I did see there was a few different like news stories on like the news website I was looking at. I'm like, there's like three articles on this. Right. He's old. He died. Enough. Um, Farragut did what they said they were going to do, and they came back, and that one guy flipped his vote, and now the uh, yeah, so planning, growth plan is, is happening. Um, I don't know what else to talk about on that one. That's a moot point. Um, Knox County Schools played some fun budget games, and they're doing a bunch of new big raises. So two two years of way about – like last year's raises were record percentage raises for all staff, and then this – New batch that's coming through, assuming that it doesn't get shot down somewhere in the process, which is very unlikely, um, because it's within the functional budget of Knox County Schools, which it's a weirdism. But uh, yeah, they're going to go and they're going to get more raises and they're going to add more budgets to. Well, there'll be some raises more than more than the cost of living raise that they do all the time, but then also adding some new positions in some certain places and stuff like that. Apparently, ESL is a very uh, high demand teaching position in Knox County Schools. Yeah. Um, so our non-English uh, first language speakers population is growing. I guess that would be the <clears throat> that would be the uh, conclusion. I would think from yeah having demand for more teachers. Um, teachers can carry guns. Maybe that's going through the state right now. Not yet, but maybe uh, the uh, the kidnapping children to take them out of state to get abortion passed the Senate this week. They don't say kidnapping. I say kidnapping. We talked about it when it was going on. Yeah. Um, that's 
uh, some top level stuff uh, that I've seen some different stuff going on. On what are you seeing going on? Mm. That's on one other bill they were talking about. That uh, age verification thing's uh, still messing around somewhere. I think it's. It looks like it's going to pass the Senate, but the House is in question. I did see, so I guess in some of the discussion of the allowing teachers or staff to to carry in a school, I don't remember seeing. I guess they at some point last year or in this session they passed a a budget resolution or whatever to give schools funding for every school to have a SRO. So that was something like I guess the four or five Democrats that are in Congress. They didn't already have SROs? Yeah. The one, the, I guess like the sponsor of the bill, like when he was talking about it, presenting it or whatever, that's what he started out with that, you know, we have this many schools and this many of the schools don't have an, don't have an SRO, which of course they just threw that right back at his face. And we're like, we just passed a bill. So every school could have SROs. And you're saying your bill is because we have schools that don't have SROs. So what, what are we doing? What are we doing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's kind of weird. Like what, what I'm not sure. I'm in a weird, like, I'm not sure how they're going to do it. I mean, cause you know, most arguments of like homeowners of like, Hey, you, you know, to be a responsible gun owner in your house, you should have your, your firearm locked up. So I would assume there would be some kind of guidelines for that in the school system for whoever has it. Well, there's some... it, they're trying to keep it anonymous so so no one knows, and then so the kids don't know, the kids can't find out, so that doesn't turn into a further issue, right? And I, I that's what I that's where I'm kind of lost on some of the parts and pieces of it. It's because it's like I get that, and in, fu- in, in in a tactic for the tactical standpoint of it, like just for the sheer tactical analysis of a situation, if you are a concealed carry, part of the reason you conceal carry is for the conceal part. Because you are in a better position when your potential assailant doesn't know you're carrying. Right. They are. Le- they are. They are. They are more likely to stall or for you know. They're. They're. Rephrase. If you're carrying openly, they're more likely to shoot you immediately if they have a gun, or flee immediately, or do something crazy immediately. Where if it's concealed and they don't know you have it, they're going to treat you like anybody else. Like I understand that as a premise, but then as the parent in me goes. Well, okay. You want this school choice. You want my like. You want freedom of information for parents on what books are in the libraries and what we're using in curriculum. You want like this same GOP supermajority is you know screaming up and down, yelling everywhere about how parents, parents' rights, parents' choice, parents' rights, parents' choice. And it's like, well, I don't have the right to know that if my kid's ha- teacher has a gun. Yeah, that seems a little weird. At least inconsistent. I'm not sure where I land on it and the personal philosophies of it. I haven't spent a lot of time brewing on it. I mean, honestly, like from parts and pieces that I've seen on it so far, they are requiring some paperwork and bonding by the local uh, uh, police department or sheriff's office. They are requiring some, bonding, but it's, yeah, it's every year requiring 40 some hours training and 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 stuff like that. They're, right, and so they are requiring some of those parts and pieces, and so the principal would know, but the principal is obligated not to tell anyone else. Um, and so the principal would know because they have to go and file that paperwork with the principal and X, Y, and Z. Um, and then there's certain c- scenarios where they're not allowed to carry it. So, like, if uh, the principal calls them into the office and says, hey, we need to talk about something, we had a problem with some stuff in your classroom, they're not allowed to carry it into a potentially disciplinary meeting with their administrators. Yeah, I never really thought about that aspect. Um, and and they're not allowed to carry it, like, which they're not allowed to carry it into assembly area, so they couldn't go into the gym or an auditorium on campus with it. Weird. Yeah, I didn't quite understand some of the parts and pieces behind that. But, like, I don't know. It's, I, I don't, it's, I don't know. I don't know what to do about it. I'm not saying I want another, like, I'm not, I don't, I, like, there's some obligation to defend the children and we need to have some sort of protective whatever. We're not going to budget it in to add, you know, like, I mean, and I don't know, we don't, like, that's one of those things that I have, that, that I remember when we were in high school and we went to a band competition. Do you remember going to Uluwa for a band competition? 
Real tool. Did that for uh, indoor drum line. I think we did it for both. Anyway, I just remember being there and walking around that school and like, this looks like the scene for, this looks like the set for us. Like the entire play, like the, cause the, uh, like it's so, I mean, honestly, Bearden Middle School's kind of, kind of like it. It's a, it, they do a little better of kind of covering it up, but that Ulawa school, like, like the, the, there, like, do you remember it at all? Vaguely. Like, so like we went in whatever door we went into and it was the, um, it was like the common area cafeteria kind of combo and it was probably two and a half three stories tall as a room and then the on the ground floor one wall was like the actual like lunch you know go pick up your lunch come back out area and there was some other stuff and like the gym was over on this side and then the other thing is over on that side or whatever but then it was like two or three stories of like high railing walkways and that was the entrance to all the classrooms like it like to me it looked like uh like a prison scene. Like it really did because it's like you have the, the one little bit of common area that the criminals get in their pod. And then you have like stacked on top of each other, rows of little walkways with entrances to all the cells. That's what Ula looks like. Anyway, that's one of the things that has been a conversation among school advocates is that they're looking a lot like prisons nowadays yeah. anyway. Um, you know, and so, okay, do we want to have, you know, what's the, what's the appropriate number? Okay. Let's not let teachers carry. Let's keep that out of the classroom. Every school has three, four, five SROs to actually like, like again, on a, on a, on a tactic, like, like if you were a tactician, like a, if you were doing a tactical defense program for a elementary school and you were going to draw it up with a best, like, you know, you've been in, you've been in Rocky Hill over here. You've been in some of the elementary schools around here for one reason or the other. <clears throat> and the way these schools are set up and built because they were built years ago. Like, I don't know how you would tactically defend that school in case of a, a, a small, uh, 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 you know, I think you would, you wouldn't plan on like a full on like army assault where you have a squad of 30 guys coming in shooting, but to protect a facility like that against a one to three man active shooter situation, I can't, I don't think I, I don't see that like Rocky Hill. You'd have to have like a dozen guys on all the time to have like a functional security manpower in place. Like you can lock the doors all you want, but we're shooting through the glass and going in if that's what we're doing as the assault team. Yeah. You know? And so it's like, there's enough different entrances. I mean, hell, Rocky Hill, maybe this is, I don't know. It's public knowledge, I guess. So I'm not breaking any rules, but like almost every classroom in Rocky Hill has a door that goes directly outside. Yeah. Whether it's into the courtyard or outside of the building, like the edges of the building. Now they're always locked like fire exit capable, but they're always locked. So you can't just walk up and walk in one of those doors. Mm -hmm. But you know, if I knew the school and I wanted to go into a certain classroom, I could go up to that particular classroom and go straight into that room from outside. And how do you tactically defend that with one SRO who's, you know, that's, 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 that's my problem with the conversation. It's like, it's, it's like, I agree. I will agree in my gun friendliness that I'm not going to say that I'm perfectly keen on the premise that they're putting together here. I mean, my, my initial thought, like when they were talking, I think they started talking about this last year. Uh, I think I brought it up with, and I guess that's more in, I guess more in the mindset of, you know, parents would know who had it, but I would think there might, you know, there may be a, a small group of parents that are like, well, we need more. Or, you know, if, if it was more just like on a voluntary basis of, you know, parents starting to pressure teachers of like, Hey, you need to go get a concealed carry so you can be in here. Why and, aren't you carrying at their, at right. their at their student teacher but in that kind of same thought of how many how many is enough how many teachers in there would be enough right if you know one school decides to pick one person you know our parents gonna be like well no we need more than just one we need at least four or five Uh, my assumption was that it's anybody who wanted to they couldn't oblige anybody but they couldn't deny anybody who wanted to as as a as a faculty member or custodial staff or janitor or uh kitchen worker or any of the other uh, professional people that work there for whatever reason, if they go through the process, they can carry inside if they want to. I don't know. I mean, I think it's a big ask of a teacher. And then even then, you know, if it is one of their own students, you know, how can you ask them to, you know, essentially make a life threatening decision and you know, how, how well can they make a split second decision? of a child they've been teaching for you know six months or whatever. I don't know. I'd kind of lean into their ability to make that decision better than a third party out of nowhere running in the room officer that says, 
I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure I would, I'm not sure who's, I'm not sure who period full stop would have the ability to make that decision in a split second, whether they knew the other side or not. I would think a teacher would be more, and I mean, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It would be possibly be more hesitant, right. which could open the door to better or worse outcomes. Right. Because that, that second of hesitation can be the second that they get shot. And now the shooter has two guns. Right. Um, which is, you know, functioning. Or maybe they hesitate and, you know, the, the shooter actually puts the gun down. Like, Oh, right. you know what? Okay. Yeah. You know, and, uh, yeah, I, I like I, that's a very interesting thought. I hadn't put, I hadn't really put a th- much thought in that way. And I don't know. Yeah. I, I would Maybe see that, that as an advantage. Can't talk him down, right? I would see that as a plus in the situation. All right. Um, but I, 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 I could see it going both ways because then there's the, there's the uh, crazy, crazy inverse is the you're that annoying student. You're not actually any real threat. Yeah, that's and it, I yeah. just can't fucking handle this fucking kid anymore as the teacher who's allowed to carry. And he goes, you know right. what? That's another concern. Or if you know kids are fighting and you know. It, you know, the fight itself is getting very violent. You know, is that grounds to pull out your weapon to try to discourage? I'd be curious about the, the fight. I, I would know. think that they would add maybe a, a paragraph to the training seminar on, on that particular part of the topic. Mm-hmm. And I mean, here's the thing to be. So, or if a kid, you know, picks up, I mean, a, a pencil could be used as a weapon, but I mean, it has a weapon in their hand. Well, I mean, they have like, I, like they I, can I essentially have a, a deadly weapon in their hand. You know, it's, it's, it's not a firearm. They're coming but, right for us. Right, they're coming right at us. <laughs> um, maybe I don't know. I mean, it does. It does. It does produce a lot of questions yeah. and a lot of hypotheticals and a lot of what ifs. Um, but the only thing I don't like about that, like that idea of, oh uh, well, teachers having a bad day and that one problem student is just continuing to be a problem. I can't. I just. I just lose it and I fucking murder the kid. A lot less likely. I mean, it's not just a lot less likely. It's like if 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 that is a real a realistic possibility of a situation. We probably need to do better about vetting our teachers in the first place to have psychotic breaks in the middle of class and strangle a kid to death because they could strangle a kid to death. They could be, they could at least, they could at least do some, they, their odds of killing the kid might be a little bit lower without a gun, but they could do some real fucking damage before anything, anybody's doing anything about it. If that person snaps that hard right. instantaneously in the middle of it. So like that, I just don't like that argument as part of the conversation. Yeah. Um, but I do think it's, I, I, I am not so quick to just throw it out and be like, this is fucking crazy dumb. I mean, it is crazy dumb cause it's our GOP and they're fucking crazy dumb, but I'd say they're grasping at straws, but I, I think they're looking for a solution. I, I don't know if they want to say they did something. They're like, well, I mean, we're allowing teachers to go in armed. I mean, there's, we're not really going to ask too much more of our, I mean, I think it's, yeah. Now here's a question, and this goes into a big, broader topic. Thing is like so because they're not requiring, like you said, they they may not be requiring it, but they're just like, oh, well, we're giving the option of a teacher. Right. They're not if requiring they want to, to if they want to. Right um, now, as things currently stand, do you think a private school could use armed teachers as part of their staff without oversight? I I would think they could oversight from like you know whatever this whatever the set of rules that they're putting in place for the public schools to do it. Like this, uh, like this, this, this bill I mean, I won't. I don't know if this was just, is this just public schools? I don't, I, like, I don't think that the state has any, I any think it's authority. just allowing schools in ten, Tennessee schools, but I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know that how much authority the state of Tennessee has to do with anything that goes on in pu- private schools. Like they can't touch curriculum. They can't tell them to, what they can and can't teach. They can't tell them how and how they don't want to teach. A lot of the private schools kind of model after public schools as far as like what kind of classes they teach, what kind of hours they run and stuff like that just because for simplification of life, probably as much for the parents as the students as well. But I don't think the, the state can make the school make a, make like a sacred heart, do anything or not do anything. I mean, short of anything that's functionally criminal at the time. And I, I don't know that the state could say, I mean, the state can't like other than what is it? The, the open, the, the, the concealed carry law that they passed a couple of years ago or whatever. Actually, it goes way back before that. You just don't need the permit anymore. But like, like Tennessee gun law at large is like, <clears throat> you can carry wherever you want to carry, um, unless explicitly asked not to by the owner of the business. And then there's like a handful of exceptions. Like you can't carry in a bank. Period. All right. Regardless of the bank's want to let you or not let you or something like that. And there's but there's a couple of exceptions. I don't think that those exceptions apply to churches. I wouldn't think they would apply to private schools. Schools had always been on the list, but not necessarily right. public yeah, schools. But, right. But I don't think the private schools applied in that statement. 
So like I would think I would think that as a policy a lot of the private schools say you like you know like I have a carry permit if I was going to a private school for one reason or another they're going to say you you're not allowed to carry here. And that's their decision, but it's not a it, it's their decision and it's therefore the law only because they have the right to refuse me from carrying there, not because they don't have the right to let or not let me. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> So I'd be curious if there's any private schools that are currently doing it anyway of some or some combination like this. Um, I don't know. It's a sad world that this is a, this is not a open and shut conversation because this is a real problem that we deal with on a sadly more regular basis than it should be. It's true. It's fucking internet. So what's doing it. These kids are losing their shit on the internet. It's yeah. the internet's fault. I blame it all on the internet. See the two Michigan parents got sentenced like 10 to 15 years. Oh, the ones you were telling me about a couple weeks ago? Yeah. Yeah, I I, I get it with the, at least with the way you described it to me. It's like, you know, it seems like there's pretty hard evidence that this kid was screaming for help. And they just ignored it and looked the other way and ignored it. I mean, like, it would be like, I don't know. I'm trying to think of like. It's like one of their defenses. <clears throat> like, well, we thought he was into video games. Like some of the drawings that he was doing. Okay. They, they didn't recognize that the the gun and the the picture that he had drawn like that day was oh that oh we didn't think that looked like the gun we just bought him last week for his birthday yeah, I mean, or whatever it was but in a, like a more practical comparison like if i have a tree like if i have a really tall tree in my yard and it's in my yard fully in my yard and it falls down um into my neighbor's yard and crushes their car i'm responsible for that right you know uh, and at some level, where, like, and, and, and to, to the point we're getting to, to the specific of the point, it's like, if I have a tree that is clearly going to fall down and I just leave it standing. Now, what if it's just a part of the branch that hangs over their property? That's a weird one. I'm not sure because, because that part of the tree is, theirs. they have the right to cut it down. They cut it off up to the property line. Right. So I don't know. That's an interesting one. I like yeah. that. I like that question. Man, it's a sexy brain move. I like it. Um, but you know, yes, you, your tree fell onto their <clears throat> car, right? But especially, but especially if it was obvious, like like if it was a tree that had been struggling and branches have been falling off all the time, and there's it never makes any green anymore, and it's clearly about to fall down, and I just leave it and leave it and leave it, and it falls right. and causes damages. It's been leaning forty five for <laughs> right. <laughs> the roots are slowly coming out of the ground, and it's getting worse and worse. And I just let it go, and it's like, yeah, I think uh, I think that the, the there's grounds for a negligible case on top of just my insurance covering your car. Like if that tree fell on your car while you were in it and killed you in it, right. I could go. I could get behind the case saying, "Okay, yes, you're civilly liable for a wrongful death, as well as the insurance on the car and all the other shit that the tree did damage you." But I could see a DA making the case of, "This is not just an accident that you're at fault for because it's your property. You're actually negligible, criminally negligible in this case." You know, or another one's like a dog. Like you, if you have a dog that's that's that is a that just attacks people constantly and you don't do your due diligence to keep that dog in check and that dog is goes out and goes yeah that's your fault you, you know <clears throat> you're responsible for that property and kids are property until they're 12 15 17 18 i don't remember exactly what the number is but they are your property for at least some period of time that is, i don't know that it, it's interesting that's super interesting i don't know how to describe it but I like it. It's interesting. It's fun stuff. <clears throat> I'm super excited. Jennifer Owen is driving our derby car. It should be good. It should be super fun. It's not fair. She can't. We How much it. required? Yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah. I, like I, I, like my rules are pretty intense on that kind of stuff. Like, not really. It's got to be at least a. But it, it has so to be. Is Rubens Rubens racing? It's a DOT certified helmet. It can't just be like a bike, like a cheap bicycle helmet. It's got to be right. uh, like. You, if you were wearing it on a motorcycle, you wouldn't get a ticket helmet. Right now, if you want to slap a DOT sticker on and lie to me about it, there's nothing I could do. Yeah. You sign the liability waiver anyway, so you crack your skull. It's your fault. At this point, I just don't want like you know. I want to do this event again, and death, uh, death at the event is probably not going to give me permission to do it no, again. No, no. So, um, at least not to you change the name. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. A couple times, change the, change ownership of the businesses and couple of other little little finagles here i mean it could be the best thing that ever happened to us like there are other our other our other planned event is around halloween so we could the ghost of whoever died at the spring event is at our october event 
Yeah, That's awesome. terrible. I'm a terrible person. I'm going to hell for that one. Oh, I'm trying to think of what else is going on this week. I've not like do like plenty has gone on this week. I've just not had the mental capacity to touch it as much as I I normally do. Like I didn't read my Compass newsletter daily emails mm-hmm. once this week. Like, and I'm usually like, that's the first thing I do when I get up in the morning. I sip some coffee and read my Compass newsletter. Just to get a little oversight, to a little like uh, overview is not oversight, but overview, a good, good, solid overview of what's going on. <clears throat> but I did have the city of Knoxville put, did, has, did a couple things on me. I was on WBR, which was fun. Um, it's exciting. I'm excited about this. Nice. It's all that, the, again, I apologize. It's all my brain has been on for, all right. for, for, for straight days and days and days. And then what little bit of news I've, I've consumed has been my national news coverage stuff. Um, uh, oh, the Arizona. That's the fun. That's probably my favorite national story of the week. The Arizona thing. Yeah. Their abortion, uh, their abortion law has reverted to. It was like pre, pre statehood, pre statehood, civil war era, Arizona territory law is now in effect that it is a felony to commit an abortion. I, actually, you know what? Let's go back. Let's come back to Tennessee and we'll come back to this one. Cause we are on abortion. That's the one that passed the Senate that I don't understand it. Like I'm very confused on that one. So it is it, if if it passes the house and gets through the governor's desk, it is a it will be a felony, a, a, a I think it's class C felony in the state of Tennessee to escort a minor out of the state to have an abortion performed. And I really like we talked about it when it was first introduced, and I really don't understand it functionally. Like the scenario, like I, I understand that the scenario does exist. My parents are totally against abortion. Like, okay, let me let me rewrite my let me back up and rewrite my hypothetical. I'm a 14 year old girl, and my parents are avidly against the idea of abortion. And six different ways I get end up getting pregnant. We could go the worst version of a rape case. Maybe it's incest from my dad. Maybe it's from my boyfriend. It really doesn't matter to me for the concept of what we're saying. And so like, I understand the premise of, I see, and I agree with, I see the problem with it. So I got, I, I'm 14. I get pregnant. My parents, there's no way my parents are going to let me get an abortion. And my friend Susie's parents are cool. And, you know, I told them what was happening and they're like, well, get your parents and your parents can help them do whatever. And it's like, my parents won't help. They don't believe in abortion, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> and it's <clears throat> the girl's freaking out and she doesn't know what to do. She has, like, she wants the abortion. She knows she wants the abortion. She's the other, the friend's parents are sympathetic to her, her, her plight and take her up to Virginia and assist and, and just take her to a, pl- a clinic and then bring her home. Like they lie and say they're sleeping, the, having a sleepover with her girlfriends or whatever, I don't know, whatever it is. Like that's the scenario that would seem logical to why this law would need to exist. <clears throat> and it would makes it criminal for those parents to those other adults to do that for this child. But it's already kidnapping. What if a minor does it? It's it, uh, the way I understood it. It's only it, it's it's it, it is criminal for an adult to take a minor across state lines to get an abortion. Huh. But, you know, and it's like okay. <clears throat> Again, the only scenario that that makes sense is that they do it without the parents' knowledge, which therefore means that at some level it's a kidnapping. And so, if you want to criminalize the activity, you already have that in the kidnapping part. Because the parents press charges and say they kidnapped my child, and during the kidnapping, an abortion was performed. The abortion isn't illegal in Virginia. We can't do anything about that. Now, again, there's a lot of questions about the minor's right to have an abortion with or without their parents' consent, and I get the, that that's a complicated conversation. But the, the I guess the brass tacks of this to me is that all this is all this is going to do is criminalize something that is easily criminalizable, criminalizable anyway. Because the exemption, it, it clearly states that the parents are not subject to it. So in my same scenario, if I'm 14, 14 year old girl, and I get pregnant for whatever reason, and my dad takes me to Virginia and I get an abortion, there's nothing the state's going to try to do to me or my dad. And so to me, what the, what the state is, what the, 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 the state is trying to make illegal is the transport of a minor across state lines without the parents being part of the process. And that's already kidnapping. Why do we need a new law to basically charge a pair of adults for kidnapping? <clears throat> is it 
Is it considered kidnapping just because you're in the quote unquote custody of your parents? Yeah, I would think so. If I, <clears throat> if, if I took one of my kids' friends with us to, I don't know. I mean, if, yeah, if I took, if we went to Disney. But the I'm person being kidnapped to... went, went willingly. doesn't matter. Not with a minor. It doesn't matter. Really? I don't think so. <clears throat> well, I mean, I, I, I would, th- I would, I, I would think the case would stick if I took, if like we just jumped in the car with the kids and we had a couple of their friends over and we just all jumped in the car and drew, drove to Lexington for whatever you do in Lexington for fun with a bunch of kids. And we just did that. And maybe one of my kids' friends gets hurt while in Lexington. And we get back and I got a kid with a caster with a wrap on his arm. It's like, yeah, I think he broke his arm playing. And it's like, Okay. How do you break his arm? Oh, we were in Lexington at this cool jump jam place. And it's like, wait a minute. You took my kid out of state. You had a, he had permission to stay at your house for the night, not to go to a different state with you. And I think that kidnapping charge would hold because I took it against the, without the parents consent. And I think the parents have the right to that mm-hmm. in the, in, in the, in the specific of the taking a kid somewhere other than, you know, a fairly reasonable, like, I mean, I guess theoretically a parent could allege it, <clears throat> in all sorts of ways. Like we have a kid to stay the night with and do a sleepover with our kids or whatever. And we go to the mall. I, I, I think you could try to allege that as the other parent, but I don't think a DA would pick that one up. But if I take the kid out of County or out of state, I think a DA might be willing to look at that one a little more seriously. Even if the kid wanted to go, doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, it certainly would be a kidnapping if you were like a deadbeat dad that came and took your own child, even though you don't have custody, that's kidnapping. The kid wants sure. to go. They like their dad. They're not a deadbeat to, to the kid. They're just a deadbeat to the spouse. So I just think it's it's just weird. Like I guess is what I'm trying to get at is it seems like it's a, it's it seems just seems like it's a it's unnecessary functionally to exist. And that one seems more like a posturing issue. I guess is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. Is it's really just a we're making it harder for you know these radical leftists to steal your children and give them abortions. We're going to put a stop to this. This, this, like, this will fix it. And it's like, you already, you, you already, you already stated the solution in your problem. They're stealing kids. That's a crime. <laughs> That's the crime you should care about. Not the crime that they're giving their kids a, 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 a medical procedure that you don't agree with. But anyway, so yeah, Arizona, we're pre civil war, pre state abortion law in Arizona, which is like zero full stop. It's where it's about, I mean, it's basically where we are, except we, we voted to get here. They just had some trigger law that fell sideways that apparently was foreseeable by people who understand the, the way the Arizona's constitution works. Their, their version of the trigger law that they had in effect, um, didn't have a landing pad, basically like it reverts to, and there's nowhere since it became a state where they have any legal ruling on how to deal it. So the, the most recent on the books thing in Arizona dealing with abortion is this 1886 full ban felony for per- performing abortions. <clears throat> did see that or did hear today that, uh, there was a couple of bad support economic indicators that came out and the fed was, uh, was hinting that they were going to drop rates and now their hint has changed to, we may just leave rates where they are and not go up or down. <clears throat> like a week or so ago, they were looking to drop rates, you know, possibly by the fall, but they also said, you know, it wasn't going to be any kind of like political thing. It wasn't like, Hey, we're going to drop rates like right before the November elections. I mean, do you, would, would they say it if it was? <laughs> No. <laughs> so either way, I'm not going to know that one. I'm not going to pick that part of it apart. I don't really care that much about that one. I think it's, uh, I mean, I think it's not an abnormal. It, it, there is, there is a little bit of a cycle. If you go back and look at rates, um, depending on where the other day, like for a while, like we were at 0% interest rate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There was a, there was that like, there was like top economists having a discussion about whether a negative interest rate might be something to put on the table. Yeah. Which I don't know how that works. Yeah, I, don't know. I mean, that's basically saying, hey, bank, borrow a million dollars from us and you're only going to give us 800000 back over 
10 years or whatever the term is. You know, interest rates are still high. But kind of what if it's that thing we kind of forget. It's like, oh, you forgot about like the five to 10 years that we had zero percent. Well, I know it wasn't that long, but it doesn't matter. It I was mean, at least like three or four years of zero percent in interest rates. But it goes like, okay. So it is, okay. That, that reminds me of another story I heard that this is that, uh, it's like Bloomberg or Forbes or one of them that does all their like annual, you know, richest people, like top f- 500 companies, top 500 richest individuals, those kind of things. All right. Apparently in one of those things that they always do is they always have a list <clears throat> of the richest under 30. And the most recent one they put out is the first time in the history of doing the list that none of them did anything to get their billions. And they were all in the billionaires club. Like they were all heiress, heirs or heiresses to fortunes or whatever. None of them, none of them were even like stockbrokers or any of those guys that mm-hmm. are in the richest filings of people. Venture capitalists, you know. And I, I have a, I have a tough spot. Like I have a tough spot with like you know, uh, the, I, I don't know. Like there's, I, I don't necessarily understand the premise. Okay, I work, I do my things, I take care of my business, I do all that kind of stuff. I pay my taxes while I'm alive and while I'm living my life and stuff. And I accrue a a decent nest egg when I retire and I die at some point and I got some money left over and I have that, I will that to my kids. I, I I don't, I don't necessarily understand the moral necessity that because my kids didn't quote work for that money, that they don't deserve that money, that that should be taxed out of them in capital gains or estate taxes and stuff like that. That doesn't really make sense to me. It's like, I, I earned that money. I paid taxes on that money to make that money. I did all that kind of stuff. I died. I give my leftover money to my kids. I don't really like, I don't mind the premise of some small tax. In, the, in I mean, I do mind the premise and the core level of it, but just for conversation's sake. And, you know, and, and realistically, I'm complaining about something that can and won't ever apply to me because my dad, the, my dad's got some money, but it's not equitable enough that I'm going to lose a bunch of taxes if I, if, and when I inherit anything from him, I'm not in the bracket of people that we're actually talking about here. I understand that, but it's like, you know, um, like, I don't know, you're the, you're the heir to the, the Heinz fortune or whatever. You're the great, great grandkid of whoever Heinz that invented ketchup for lack of a better word. You know, I mean, you're five, six generations down and you're still inheriting billions of dollars. That's kind of crazy, but I don't know. It's like, you know, my granddad had a bunch of money and he left some money for me. Why does the, why, like, why would there be some moral obligation that the state gets that tax, gets to tax the shit out of that and take a huge portion of that more than they take anybody much, else's income? How much is taxes on it? Some, uh, well, there's not a lot right now, but that's the, well, okay, let me back up. The complaint is, and I, and I don't disagree with the complaint, the, but the complaint is that these richest people in the world under 30 all inherited it. So there, there's not, a, there's not as much a state tax and death taxes as there used to be. It used to be higher. It's come down in recent years. That was one of the Trump cuts that he did back in when he was there. But I still think there's like some of it's like up to like 40, 50% when you're in the higher echelons of it. If it's not well managed in dodging it. Yeah. I think if it's like, I think if it's a straight, I think if it's, I think if it's over, I think it's when it gets to like above 10 million. I think the actual tax rate of above 10 million in inheritance tax is supposed to be like 40 something percent. But everybody that has $10 million has an accountant that knows how to move that money from them to their kid without letting that tax apply. All right. And a lot of them just like, let's start a trust. Yeah. You know, and so like, you know, but like, it's like, okay, again, it goes back to my thing about taxes in the first place. If it wasn't so damn complicated and so huge, I wouldn't try to figure out ways to avoid it. It, but if you made it a reasonable number, like if it was 10%, you know, most probably most, most even st- stupid wealthy people would be like, okay, 10% of my billion dollars, whatever. I still got $900 million in my account, but it's 40%. It's half a billion dollars. I'm going to do a little, see what I can do to make that as minimal as possible. You know? And so I guess, I don't know. That's my kind of take on that general concept. Okay. Um, and so anyway, going back to the original part of it, it's like, I find that that list more concerning in the fact that in the fact that it's like, where are the makers? Where's the next, you know, Jobs or Gates or, you know, uh, Musk for lack of a better word? Where's this next generation of people that make stuff? Or well, that, that make businesses? Make. That make businesses? Like, 
We can argue like I don't know I don't know the history of Tesla. I'm sorry, I I, I interrupt. I don't you. know the perfect history of Tesla. I mean, hell, like that's the Gates story too. Gates stole it from uh, Bill. What's the other guy's name? What no Wozniak? Yeah, Wozniak. Yeah, you know, it's like so. It was like Jobs, Wozniak, and Gates were all kind of buddies, and then they kind of all started beating each other. Like you know, but like at least it's been argued. Wozniak has come out and said that he created Windows, and Bill Gates stole it from him. Or some maybe lighter term than that, but Bill Gates took the company from him and it did a bunch of behind the scenes shit once the company existed and took the company over and blah 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 blah. That's not abnormal in when you get into that range of business. And I'm not saying it's a good or a bad thing. It's just that just is. And I understand that Tesla or uh, Tesla uh, Musk falls under that category as well. But I mean Bezos. I don't know the whole like history of Amazon, but Bezos created something. Like he created something that nobody else did, and has taken over commerce. You know, like Bezos to me deserves to be one of the richest people on the planet. Now, does he deserve to keep all his money? Should he do better stuff with his money? We can argue about that separately. But as far as he came in and changed the way we do life with his business model. Yeah, I wonder how much of that. I don't even know if it was his idea because it started out as what, like a book company basically? Yeah. Like a book sale? It was an online bookstore. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how much that he. Uh, yeah, I, you yeah. Know. I don't know how much of it was his ideas of like, hey, let's go into this, and hey, let's start selling that, and hey, what if we do this? <clears throat> I don't know. He could have had a big hand in it, but yeah. Again, I don't I know. Like odds are, it was someone else. I, I, so, right. I don't know the figure history. Figure out we mix more money. And they're like, well, we can start selling more stuff on the website. Okay. Maybe a better, maybe a better place to have a little bit of a conversation about this. Uh, that because this is one of those things that I always get lost in when I get when we get into economics and stuff like that. Is there's like this, you know, like. Um, the, the, there's capital versus labor. It's the age old battle in, in economics. It's, it's the people that own the company and the people that do the work of the company. And I've seen different things where they, there's, this is where you get, I don't know how to describe it. Um, I've seen some different things on it where it's like, I saw this one video where it's this professor and he's teaching his class about how, if you work at a job, you're not getting paid what you deserve. It doesn't matter what you get paid. Because the only way that job exists is that they're charging more for what your hour of labor produces than they're paying you. you know, Sounds functionally. Right. Yeah. But logical. the way he was presenting it is that your boss is stealing from you. Because if they're selling it for more than it takes or for more than they're paying you, then you're producing more than you're getting paid for. <clears throat> um, and it's one of those things that like my, 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 uh, my base lower self like retort is always like, well then go start your own. Like I get like, just like, why don't, why don't we have companies that do this? Why don't people treat their, you know, like go start your own, do it. What are you waiting on? Nothing's stopping you. And I think, I, I, I think it goes to the same thing we complain about in politics as well. It's like, there's, there's this, uh, some of it is laziness. There's this assertion that they know what they're doing and I'm going to leave it alone. And that's how employees treat their bosses. And that's not the right way to be as an employee. You should understand a little bit more about how the thing works and actually get a good, try to get a better feel for what you're actually worth to what you're doing than just accepting that they know everything because they're the boss. That's not the way to do it. Just like, I don't think that's the way the politics should run either. <clears throat> but like, you know, to me, like, it's like, you know, I'm trying to think of one of the specifics, but like, you know, especially in production, you get this whole thing where it's like you have these big production facilities that build whatever they build. And, you know, and then you have line workers. They're like, well, you know, we do all this work and they sell this car for this much money. And if you break it out, like if they've done it with cars, like they'll go like how much a car costs in labor hours right. and stuff like that. And it's like, well, you know, they sell the car for 40 grand and 22,000 of that is labor hours. It's like, okay, well, if they're selling the car for that much, I should get paid more. It's like, okay, then you go buy the equipment and you go buy the parts and you go buy the thing and build a car and see if you can get 50 grand for the same amount of labor that you're doing. You're not gonna, it's not like that. Like, I don't think, I think people like simplify the way they think that they think, especially production, but even service industry works and they kind of gap out, like they just kind of blank out the idea that, I don't know, we pay rent or insurance or other taxes for other things or stuff like that. And they just think that it's like, well, if... I do a thing that you sell for 10 bucks, then I should get 10 bucks because I made it. It's like, mm, it doesn't work that way. Right. I don't know how else, like, I don't know how else to, to break that one down. 
but it seems like people think that way on certain things. And it's just like, it's like, I don't know how to explain this to you to make you understand it. But all the rich kids don't do anything. And that's a problem to me. Maybe for a different take than other people, but it's a problem to me. Like, I don't like the idea that like, you should make something you, like it's, it's what do we value as a society? We don't value your, like, I don't know. I value my ketchup, I guess. I do like ketchup. And the man who is the, who created the best ketchup in the land. I don't know if it's the best ketchup in the land, but, um, he created the biggest, best ketchup, make ketchup company in the land deserves a, deserves to have some, some financial legacy for lack of a better word. But the idea that five generations later, <clears throat> they're the richest kids in their age bracket because you are the creator of the biggest ketchup brand in the land seems a little bit much to me too. There should be somebody else coming up, creating a new thing, not just hand me down money being the top of the food chain. Very interesting story. I think it was at PR today. That was I don't know if this was an idea that's been floated around, but uh, kind of like regulating grocery prices or I guess the price at like the wholesale level, basically, and trying to make it more equal. I know you've talked about how they do it in like the beer industry. I don't know if liquor is the same. Uh, I I don't know. I'd be curious. I, I it's I don't know because I'm not sure. Uh, beer is interesting. Liquor is a little more problematic, but it's still the same thing. The thing about it is the way beer and liquor work um, is that um, region, like some level of regional exclusivity of distribution exists on every brand that you see in the store. You're drinking, you're drinking that Miller Lite product that is distributed by Cherokee distributing in the overall East Tennessee region. <coughs> And if you want to sell Miller Lite, if you want to be a retailer of Miller Lite, whether it's on or off premise, you must buy that wholesale from Cherokee. I can't make a phone call to Molson Coors or whoever the fucking parent company is and have them ship me shit directly. That that is illegal. It is illegal to import alcohol into the state of Tennessee without a special permit. If you have that permit and somebody else owns exclusivity on it, it is illegal for you to purchase it. All right. So like I, it's not like I could like you know, and so it's a problem. I it's 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 a problem I have, and I'm not exactly sure. I don't understand. Like, I'm not sure exactly why or how it works the way it works, because like the, it's it it's occurred to me to be like, well, I'm going to be like if I had again, it goes to some of our certificate need conversation last week. Like if I had a group of investors get together, got a hundred million dollars together, bought a couple of trucks, bought a warehouse, and then go out and try to bring brands in to carry. Who's it hurt if I bring Miller Lite in as one of my brands? You know, like where's the where, where's the where's the loss in that? Why why what logical sense does state intervention in competition make sense? Because that's essentially what it is. The state requires these different parts and pieces that makes it possible, it, impossible at least for a one to one competition in the distribution of beer in the state of Tennessee. Like, I mean, hell, you got different distributors in different parts of the state that can't come in. Like, there is a different distributor. Uh, Cherokee's not a good example with Miller, but, like, uh, <clears throat> I'd worked for Littman Brothers for a long time. In the greater Nashville area, Littman Brothers carries, um, almost, like, most of the craft beers. Like, tons of the tons of the craft family of beers. Uh, um, but maybe maybe just for one, for one very explicit example that I know exactly. In the greater Nashville area, Littman Brothers distributes Jack Daniels. Now, Lemon Brothers distributes in East Tennessee, but they don't distribute Jack Daniels in East Tennessee. Now, Lemon Brothers has Jack Daniels in their warehouse. I can't go to the Lemon Brothers warehouse here and be like, hey, can you order me a case of Jack Daniels? They have access to it, but they cannot ship it into a wholesaler or a retailer of any type in East Tennessee. All right. Now, D&V, who owns the rights to Jack Daniels in East Tennessee, is who I have to order my Jack Daniels from. Now... In my simple economic brain, I'm thinking, well, what if Jack Daniels could sell it? Or what if Lippman Brothers could sell it to me cheaper? How is this exclusivity helping me as the customer? Because it's not allowing me options to maybe have, maybe Lippman Brothers has a better distribution network and they can deliver it to me cheaper. So therefore they charge me a dollar less a bottle, which makes a huge difference when you're moving product like that. And so it's a very, like, there are some things, there are some, um, some catches that the Tennessee law has put in on the alcohol distribution game that I think are reasonable or that, that try to at least elicit some fairness. Um, 
but uh and then i think alcohol too is so ubiquitous at this point there's so many options that it does keep jack daniels for example or dnv it keeps dnv in check on some level of overpricing jack daniels in the in the district yeah because if they go too high i can just get jim bean or i can go get woodford reserve that's a little bit pricier but you know, it's like, well, if I'm going to pay that much a bottle, I might as well get Woodford. I like it better. I just didn't want to pay that much. That's why I drank Jack instead or something like that. And so there's enough products on the market that it's kind of has a, an offsetting effect. And there's some law behind it. That's like, like, uh, bulk discounting rules and stuff like that. And alcohol kind of make it harder. Um, make like beer, for example, if, um, a 24 pack of, if, if a distributor sells this beer in a 24 pack, they have to sell it for the same price and they have to have it available to anybody in the market. So you can't bring a beer in and sell it to a bar for 12 bucks cause they buy 50 cases. And then another bar for 20 bucks is only buy two. Like you cannot do that in beer. That's illegal. And so that's a, a little bit of a backstop to help us retailers out against this kind of state permissed monopoly. And so some of that's like, so I, I think that, I think over the years that it's, it's worked itself into a fairly reasonable set of laws to kind of offset some of the monopolistic behavior that the, that the original part of the laws created, but it's crazy. And so I could see like, like having lived in it as a retailer under the alcohol side, I could see where some of that stuff falling into place on a, in a grocery setting could functionally work. Cause it could certainly help out the idea of a mom and pop grocery store coming back. And I would like to see that, you know, where the, I think it's more come to the forefront of like Kroger bought out or Kroger is merged with Wegmans or something. There's a couple like big grocery retailers that have, yeah. Kroger's have, also got Harris Teeter. It's another, the it's, uh, they're, they're a fairly large brand in the Carolinas. Yeah. I've seen them in, yeah. In North Carolina. But they were interviewing one guy that was kind of like a middle middle person for grocery stores in Texas, and he was talking about silly Walmart, just with the buying power they have, and just other Kroger and et cetera, of of the buying power they have with, I guess the main food suppliers. I don't really know yeah, how that just pick, how that works at that. Pick level. one at random Tyson, the Tyson Meats. Like that would be one that like between Walmart, Kroger. And like two other companies, they could buy all the. Tyson. Then I don't, I don't know if they buy direct from Tyson or if there's a middle person between that. Yeah. But anyway, he was talking about um, Walmart. I think he mentioned like a name brand, like Cake Mix, and he was like, you know, Crocker. Walmart. I, mean, I can't remember I which one sorry. it was. D- details on board. My bad. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna interrupt again. Uh, Cake. But brand. he was saying, yeah, he was saying that at at Walmart, what Walmart sells it for, isn't is lower price than what he can even buy it for. Yeah. And he's still got to sell that to the grocery stores. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, well, and I don't know, that's a game that grocery stores have played. They play on alcohol too. <clears throat> it is not, it is not in often that with some of your name brand yellow beers, it's cheaper than they pay for it, that they put on the shelf at Kroger sometimes. Right. They will often do like, it's a $30 cost case of a, uh, you know, like a, a, a suitcase as they call it. A 24 pack of Bud Light cans is, Twenty dollars on special this weekend. All right. Well, Kroger paid twenty four dollars for that case, but they're giving up that four dollars a case because you're going to buy a pizza, exactly, and a bag of chips and uh, whatever else while you're there, and they're going to make their money back. Right. So that's a marketing game on on the retail retail end of that. But yeah, like it's it's uh, yeah because Walmart. Like, yeah, I see what you mean. It's like Walmart's probably going directly to Betty Crocker, for example. We're just going to guess, um, and they're buying days worth of production, and Walmart's backing up a dozen trucks All right. and then sending those to their distribution centers across the country and then splitting up those trucks and mixing and matching with all the different other stuff. And it goes out and Kroger's buying that box of cake mix for 65 cents or something like that. And they're eating all the logistics costs and stuff like that. But even on the end of the day, it gets to the shelf and they're charging two fifty for it where all that same logistics and stuff is wrapped up in this guy's wholesale price and he's paying two seventy five for it. And then he's trying to get a deal with Kroger or somebody else to deliver it and try to make a little bit. He's got to make a little cut in there somewhere for his time. So he's trying to sell it for three bucks and it's like, well, I can go to Walmart and just buy all theirs off the shelf for two fifty, and then put them on my shelf and sell them. Yeah. I think he was more like a middleman, I guess, for like 
not necessarily mom and pop, but like smaller grocery right. stores that weren't major grocery stores that have their own distribution network. I mean, it's a, again, it's a, it's a, it, it, I, I, it's interesting in, in, in a thought experiment, but you know, it's like, well, I like the idea of mom and pop grocery stores, but I also like the idea of buying a box of cakes mix for two fifty instead of three fifty at the mom and pop store. All right. You know, and when I do go, like we use Butler and Bailey all the time. We don't do our full grocery shopping there, but we use it all the time. And it's significantly more expensive. And I accept that for the convenience because it's very close to my house. But I also like I, I like what they do. And so I'm willing to pay that incrementally, not all the time, but incrementally to support what they're doing there. Yeah. Um, now, if I could have it both ways, I guess that'd be awesome. If I could just do all my shopping there and not have to do most of my shopping at Aldi and then just get the couple of things I forgot at Aldi or that Aldi doesn't carry there. But I just thought it was an interesting thing. I was like, ah. well, it's not been the biggest fan of, you know, companies that large just having that kind of buying power or just yeah. mar- market power, basically. Yeah. And it gets, I mean, and, and especially when you get into Walmart levels, it gets to the point where as the producer, you don't have a choice. Right. Like it's not even like it's it's not even Walmart's power against the mom and pop competitors. It's Walmart's power against that producer. Like there's probably there's probably times where Walmart comes in and be like, "We're buying everything you're producing this month," and they're like, "Well, okay, great, awesome," and they're like, "But we're paying twenty five cents a case," and they're like, "It costs us fifty cents a case to make it." We know we're still only paying twenty five percent twenty five cents a case. And they don't, they have to, they can't functionally do it without it. And so they have to eat that and lose a little bit of money on this round and make it up somewhere else. Yeah. It's possible. Know, and that's, you know, and, and that's, I mean, it's unfortunate for everybody, but Walmart and when you like, even the, even the other end of it, it's, is getting beat up by Walmart in some of these cases. That's how they get. I don't know if, how often contracts come into place with stuff like that. Or if you sign just like six month contracts. It depends. Yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, I think. I think it depends on the particulars of the, I mean, I, I think you could on some level, especially dry goods. You could probably get away with some contract work. I think when you get into produce or anything like that, it's a little harder to do. Yeah. And I think if I mean, you know, I think, I don't think, I wouldn't think Walmart would want a contract with you because they want to be able to dump you in a heartbeat. Right. So Walmart wants to be like, yeah, okay. And they're like, yeah, those six months you can do this and we'll, we'll guarantee this price for six months. Okay, cool. You can guarantee that price. Okay, yes, guarantee that price for six months. But oh, we're only guaranteeing that if you sign a contract. We're not signing that contract because we'll find somebody else that's going to undercut you in a, in a month. Right. But, but we'll get this first round from you at that sweet price, and then we'll move on. Right. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know what the solution to some of those are either. I'd like I'd like to be in a world where you where we as the consumer could actually have some choice, and and it goes back to that economics conversation we've talked about a couple times. At some level, there is no choice anymore. I can't afford to choose. I mean, like in just in my throwaway example, just a minute ago, I can't afford to choose. I, I can't afford to choose to support my mom and pop grocery store that's right next door to me. I can't afford that choice. I'd like to. I'd love to be able to just do all my shopping over there. I just instead of buying, you know, a week at a time like we do, I'd buy like two days of groceries at a time and then go back there and shop a little more. Because then we don't have like you know a fixed schedule for the week. It's like, oh well, what are we having for dinner this week? We already have our five days planned out. What are we having for dinner for the next two days? All right, I'll go over to Butler and Bailey, pick up a few things, yeah. and then you know, hey, I know you guys are talking about maybe doing this. You guys want to do that today? Okay, cool. Whenever Butler and Bailey get one, need to do it, and come back. If I could afford to do that, I totally would. And it's not Butler and Bailey's fault. It's, I, I again, it goes back to that, that greater economic thing we were talking about a couple weeks ago. It's like there's. Like uh, there was a report, a uh, consumer report that came out this week, early this week. Um, like uh, home prices is a huge one, um, but like uh, maintenance, insurance, and non non car car related costs. So not the purchase of the vehicle, but like all the other stuff that goes along with owning a car. Um, other than gas, which was up like one and a half percent, was up like twenty percent. So car repairs. Yeah. Um, body work, insurance on cars. Um, now apparently some of that was, uh, 
You know, labor's gone up, and then there was just that general parts shortage for especially like microchip or not micro, yeah, microchips, anything that yeah. had semiconductors and whatnot in them. Yeah, and the, part of that apparently was also that part of the pandemic, as well as uh, a lot of insurance, a lot of insurance, a lot of insurance companies did a bunch of little rate games during the pandemic and dropped costs, and so people actually got some discounts because so many less people were driving during the pandemic. So the insurance companies weren't paying out as much as they had been. And so like some of these companies that have like the, if you don't have an accident in the next number of years, we pay this much back. Or people were uh, like uh, companies were doing, were advertising new rates because their costs were down because they weren't doing as many repairs. And so people were switching from their current car insurance company to a new one at a lower rate because they could do those lower rates because nobody was driving because it was in the middle of the pandemic. All right. And then now everybody's driving again and those accidents are back up and those rates are coming back up faster than they fell. I think mine have changed, been pretty much unchanged for a while. But I think the other one, uh, the, again, so going back to the grocery one, I think that same consumer report says that it said something along the lines of it was like the same amount of groceries. Um, so if you went to Kroger or Aldi or wherever you normally shop, if you got the same exact shopping cart today that you got exactly one year ago, it would cost you an average of $232 more. That's the best illustration of, of, of why the economic indicators that the white house likes to talk about and, um, stuff like that does not apply. Like, yes, I agree. Inflation or, uh, inflation's calming down. Uh, unemployment's at, at a super low level, uh, wages are coming up, but my wages aren't coming up faster than that last year's, you know, 200, it's up two groceries are up 200 percent ish yeah. over a year to get the same amount of groceries. And that's, that's a lot, you know, um, I don't remember exactly like there was, they, they broke down like that shopping cart. Cause I think what they did was like, it was like a gallon of milk, a loaf of bread. Like they. They filled the shopping cart as far as staples like, or whatever kind of general. Yeah. Like this is kind of what the average person buys on a shopping trip. Last year it cost 200 and uh, 180 bucks. Now it costs almost 400 bucks or something like that, which is fucking crazy. That's a, that's a huge jump. Wouldn't if you're, if, you know, and your, uh, and your car insurance is going up. And if you happen to have to move somewhere in that, the amount of apartment you're getting or the amount of house you bought is either less or significantly more expensive either less of a house or right. significantly more expensive and it's like well yeah i got a job which i didn't have before but i can't afford anything so i mean the groceries i can understand you know 2020 groceries you know skyrocketing supply chains were fucked up but i right. don't think supply chains are as fucked up yeah. now and i don't and and, and uh, let me earnings be, reports come out and it's like we're making blah, right blah, blah, i was blah, about blah. to say let me let me let me say at first that i i absolutely acknowledge that there's some corporate greed issues that are a huge portion of this I won't say it's totality on them, but I would say majority. Because I mean, they know, for the most part, people are still going to have to buy. Well, it goes back to what I was saying again. You don't. I don't. You don't have a fucking choice. All right. You don't have a choice. Like it's like I need to fill my pantry so my kids can eat. That's something that made me chuckle the other day. I guess there was like some TikTok trend of people talking about different uh, like generic brand yeah, stuff they I, buy. I, and I was like, about that? I, I remember saying seeing that a couple it? weeks ago, and I thought I brought it up. Maybe. I was just yeah, like, like what? they're bragging this, about this it. is a new concept. Yeah, because they're all broke. I'm like, it's what I was doing before. Like, I love me some Apple Dapples. Eh? I stopped buying Apple Jacks. Some Kroger brand Apple Dapples. Yeah. Yo, yo. Like I was stupid or I was intelligent enough at like 19 and 20 of like, I'm pretty sure I can't afford a name brand. But hey, that's still almost the same it's thing. It's like 95% close enough. Right. You know, I'll take I'll take the quality drop. Right. Uh, the, the little bit of quality drop for the price difference, and I, you know, and I, but, but I think, I, but I, I think that TikTok trend is one of the illustrations of the reality that is the difference between what the Biden administration is trying to say that they're doing with the economy. I don't disagree with them. I do say I mean, their numbers are right. I mean, I get what you're trying to say, but at the same time, I would say 95% of the time, any kind of, you know, official numbers that are coming out about the economy or the exact number, that's what they're talking about. Sure. I understand what, what we conceptually consider the right. economy, but anytime but you, can, you hear about economy numbers, they talk about an inflation rate. Sure. But when, when I, I believe that the, the, one of the biggest factors in elections, especially presidentially is the economy. Right. 
and when it's do I stick with what I have or do I go to something new? The worse the economy is, whether uh, the, the 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 worse the functional economy, I guess maybe to clarify, the functional economy, how I feel the economy is, regardless of what they tell me those numbers are, is probably does is probably the biggest single factor in, in elections. Unless you are a – like that, that, that's probably the most common single issue for voters. Maybe that's the better way to put it. Yeah. You have single-issue voters that are abortion, abortion single-issue voters left or right. You have single-issue people on gun control left or right. Um, but I think the largest overall is, is, is the feeling of economy, which is this amorphous term, and I get that. Right. But it's how I feel about the economy. It, you know, if, I'm a, if, if I'm a potentially independent or swing voter that I don't have super feelings X, Y, or Z on – you know, abortion or gun control or all these other things. The thing that matters to me is my ability to pay my bills. If I feel like the economy sucks, I'm probably going to vote for the guy that isn't currently in yeah, or well, isn't affiliated with the party that's currently in. And that's why we traditionally have this, you know, until this time around, we had this eight cycle, eight cycle, eight cycle, but it always switched parties every cycle. So I'm voting for the guy that's in the party that isn't the one that I don't like the economy about. I almost sent it to you. I think AP and I guess they are always doing like NROC or whatever poll, and it was split about a third, third, third. Is and and people they uh, or the respondents as far as a third thought that you know the economy and their lives were better during Trump. A third thought that their the their lives were better than with with Biden and about a third you know their lives weren't really affected much either way. Yeah. And I mean, but and I think, and I'll bet you, if you went the demographic, if they broke down the demographics of those thirds, I'd say the better. I'd say the the people that feel better about the economy under Biden than they did about Trump are older. I would I would I would wager that that's the that if that's the demographic background. One guy they quoted um, said his was better, but I, th- I think he said he was retired. Right. I, like I would bet. No, sorry, that, I thought you said it backwards. Sorry. No, yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. I'd say the the older they are, the more they're going to feel like the current economy is better now than it was before. No, he was saying his 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 life was better during the Trump years, the Trump presidency. Interesting. Um, I would I would think that demographically it's different. I think I think it would demographically would be like, <clears throat> yeah. I think the younger you are, the less happy and or the less you the the worse you feel about the economy than and. And it gets better as you get older. That would be my guess. Yeah. Um, just because, I mean, realistically, it's like, you know, like I joke about all the time. I, I, it's not even a joke. It's like the real question. It's like, what are my kids going to do with their lives? How are they going to make money? How are they going to pay their bills? Um, you know, uh, and, you know, I think a good chunk of it is we lay a bunch of shit at the president's feet that aren't necessarily under, realistically, the purview, <clears throat> which is our own issues as voters. But we certainly don't have... Um, I, I, you know, I could see it being from a kid's pers- from a younger adult's perspective. If I feel bad about the economy, I'd have to assume that they feel worse than I do, and uh, so on. So, like I said, we're going to run a little short today. <laughs> what you got for you? Oh. Where did I see a good one before? Didn't read the story yet. Poland's kids rejoice over new rules against homework. Teachers and parents aren't so sure. Poland's, uh, as an education department, like they have outlawed homework as a practice in the schools. Like it's not allowed to happen. Talks about most people in my class. Government of... Prime Minister Donald Tusk enacted the ban against required homework this month amid a broad discussion about the need to modernize Poland's educational system, which critics say puts too much emphasis on rote learning and homework and not enough on critical thinking and creativity. Under the decree, teachers are no longer to give required homework to kids in the first to third grades. In grades four to eight, homework is now optional and doesn't count towards a grade. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I don't know. That's a, I don't know. I I would need a teacher to come talk about the value or, or loss in value for that policy. I'd say there's arguments to be made on both Mm -hmm. sides of it that some would say, you know, it's just busy work. 
I was, it, you know, it's it's putting that. No, well, you know, it's like the ten thousand hours rule. You know, right? You want to get a, you 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 know, you may not master it, but if you spend an hour on it, practicing it, you're going to be better at it than not. Right. And so, you know, I could, you know, functionally, I could see it's like you know, it's like a, we taught the concepts in class. We did a little bit of practice in class. Go home and practice it at home a little bit. You know, and if it's not required, they're not going to do it. I don't know. Like I, I've gotten to the point now where it's like I get this kind of giggle every time the kids are like they dropping the kids off at school, and it's like, all right, man, have a good day. Oh, school's the worst. School sucks. And it's like, man, I don't know how to shake you and tell you how amazing right. and how much I wish I was back in school. Yeah, I mean, I remember, I remember some of the awkward and awfuls and and moving in the middle, like moving in that halfway through my freshman year in high school thing was a big old wreck and emotionally devastating and all those things. But I would give. I wouldn't give anything. I'm like, I like me and who I am. I like my life and all that stuff. Don't get me wrong. But I, in hindsight, if I could have been, if I could have been more positive about the, of what the experience I was going through was instead of being negative about it, man, I wish I could. It wasn't that bad. It doesn't feel like it at the time though. No, it doesn't. I can remember if it was be over. I want to be an adult and be yeah, out of the school. God, it's like, fuck no, bring your ticket back. Bring I got to wake up and go to school every day. It's like, right. well, get ready to be waking up and going to work every day. <laughs> yeah. You better figure something out. You better figure something out to do. If you don't want your life, if you don't want the rest of your life to be like school, you better figure something special out quick. But what's funny is like, as I've aged, I like getting up in the morning. I like getting up and getting out of the door and I like getting my day started about the same time as school does. And I like running a school day as my life. I like it. Um, one more. Let's give me. Come on. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, uh. I was looking for that other story. No, that other story. That other story. Uh, I guess this was an interesting, uh, I guess, U.S. one. The college students are flocking to the marriage pact, mostly for fun, but some find lasting love. I guess it's to where, like, you and a friend say, like, all right, if we're both not married by 30 or whatever... We're going to get married. Okay. Okay. Cool. 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 I mean, is there any contract that goes with it? I don't understand. Like, what are you? What? I, I'm assuming it's a verbal contract. I don't, I don't think they put ink to paper, but I could be wrong. Uh, but, uh, okay. Read it. Uh, read the headline again. I'm sorry. College students are flocking to the marriage pact, mostly for fun, but some fine lasting love. All right. I don't know. Negative Nancy Me is going to go. I guess popular on nearly 90 college campuses around the U.S. I, I, popular. There's so many vaguenesses in this. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. So, like, do they have comparables? Like, in the, the aughts or in the 70s, it was only popular on 20 campuses? Like, do they do they have any statistics? Uh, let's see here. Who signs? I think it said since they started doing it, it was like half a million. Nearly half a million students have participated since the PAC first rolled out at Stanford University in 2017. Since the PAC first rolled out. Born of an economics project by two students there, the PAC involves an algorithm that rates matches based on such statements as, I prefer politically incorrect humor and I pride myself on telling hard truths. Unlike dating apps and services, each student gets just one name, a percentage on the quality of the match and an email address to reach out. Interesting. Seems a bit pigeonholed. So it's a. Um, See, so most students so do the, it's friends. a dating. Like I mean, it's like Match. dot com basically. Like it's kind of yeah. It's, it's like a dating like, service. Do they do they? Or, but is it like by design? You don't actually get to date this person. You just get to sign the pact and go like just like a. I guess once you sign up for it, you put in the answers and they give you the person's name and your percentage of match and an email address and it's and it's on you if you want to reach out. But where's the pact come in from the from the algorithm part of it? You know what I'm saying? It, you're asking me questions. I don't know. I don't, I don't know either. I'm just I'm curious. That's why I'm I'm not asking you questions or answer. I'm just asking the world the question. I don't know. Hmm. We did the pact in 2020. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any obligation into it. Like I'm I said, like, it sounds like you're, you're given the name. It's up to you if you want to reach out to them. It's not. Like, it just seems like it's a, so uh, like, well, no, no, you signed up for this. You, you have to, you have to email them and at least say hi. <laughs> well, I just meant more like, it sounds like, like 
at least on the surface, it sounds like it would be like, it's a not dating dating service. It's like, here's your match. You can sign the pack to marry them. If you don't find a better match in whatever other math method you do. So go out there on your Tinders and your match.coms and meet your meet people and date them now. But if those dates don't work out, then you hit up your one that you met on pact.com versus like, that's what it, that's like functionally. That's what it sounds like to be like, how is it how, like, uh, cause how is it d- different than any other dating service? If it's it sounds not like it's a lot less parameters. I don't think you're given like a, a full fledged questionnaire that matches you. Up. Yeah. I don't know. It's interesting. Whatever, whatever you do, whatever you got to do to meet the people. That's, that's not a bad thing. I encourage the meetings of people's. All right, man, I've got to figure out how to fall asleep. I'm going to struggle with that premise, but uh, like I said, uh, right now is this is released officially. The uh, Hollywood has started. Come down and see us. <laughs> Sam, I love your friend. I love having you here. I'm almost in agreement, and I'm on almostagreement.com, and Sam's on almost in agreement, and Sam's on almost in agreement.com. Check us out at uh, the Facebooks and the Twitters on the YouTubes. Go to the website almostagreement.com. Uh, shoot us an email almostagreement at gmail.com. Um, and uh, we'll, I will try my best not to spend all next week talking about Hollerou. Um Because the only reason I would want to talk about it is if something terribly bad happened. And I hope that doesn't happen. So uh, if you got the time and you got nothing to do today, come out and check us out. We'll be there all day, 10 to 10. Hollerou.co, happyhollerfest.com. Um, to get us on your favorite podcast provider, like, friend, follow, share, text us to your friends, whatever you can do to get people out. Um, Fond farewell goodbye to OJ Simpson. I can go the rest of my life with never having a conversation about that man again. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks so much, Mike.